Hey, what's up? This is Kevin from Kevin's Barbecue Joints, and this episode of Wine and Barbecue with Aaron Fijis is fantastic. We have an amazing guest, Billy Durney from Hometown Barbecue, with three locations two in New York, one in Miami, as well as the Red Hook Tavern, which is just down the road from Hometown Barbecue in Red Hook. And I'll be brief in this intro because it's a long one. This is about two hours long, but it is chock full of everything wonderful about wine and barbecue. Billy is just teeming with knowledge teeming with stories for the stories alone it's worth listening to this but he gives so much information about wine and why wine makes the most sense with barbecue he does feel that way and what his favorite wines he talks about a lot of different wines he talks about a lot of different restaurants he talks about a lot of different people and a lot of those people mesh and overlap with people that Aaron knows and the two of them, Erin herself is a force of nature and bold with her decisions for wine and thoughtful about that. And so is Billy. So it's one of those ones where I interject things that I know or interject things about barbecue. But I know that you will walk away with this with greater knowledge, greater appreciation for wine, and also a greater understanding for who Billy is as a person. There's one little thing in there, too, that I didn't know about, Aaron didn't know about as well, called Billy's Place. I won't tell you about it, I'll let Billy explain it, but it's gonna be awesome. So I'll try to put links below to everything that was discussed. I'll keep adding stuff as I go, because I'll listen to this a couple more times, because it is dense with information. But I can't thank Billy enough for taking the time. We also go into a few things that are Fiji's barbecue related, especially relating to Father's Day, so you wanna check that out. That's at the end of the interview. And I'll put links below, because this is episode five, so I'll put links below to the other episodes, which are all great in their own right, and interesting and different than this one. But at the end, stay safe and visit your local barbecue joint and try pairing that barbecue with wine. It's so exciting to have you on the show. So thank you for carving out some time in your really busy schedule to do this with us. Um, we're really Mom, excited. My family. <laughs> You're my favorite festival drinking buddy. Uh, <laughs> Um, no, I we gotta, think that's we gotta get, well, I'll be there for, uh, in October. So we'll, well, I'm going to bring a lot of wine. So well, that's what I was hoping you were going to say. Um, yeah, we're going to go, we're going to go big. I'm oh, really for, excited. So, so yeah, we've bring, got I'll bring this in October. One for you. Oh, nice. Wow. <laughs> uh, are you sure? <laughs> hey, let it yeah, why not? It's young, but it's still DRC. Yeah, I have some wines here just lined up like random, but then the opposite polar thing to that would be like, you know, just Arnold Roberts Pinot Noir. So like if we talked about different, different places and regions, so yeah. I actually you can't see it, but I have a fleet of wines out here. Oh, nice. From very inexpensive wines to very expensive wines and stuff. So I don't know. We'll see what we get to. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, I, uh... it's, it sounds like these, these always kind of meander in the in a wonderful way but then it's like an hour we're like wow i can't believe you spoke for an hour about yeah so yeah yeah, yeah. i'm just a knucklehead here to tell you what you know talk to you I'm good <laughs> and we spoke four years ago i was looking online i didn't realize it was four years since we last did our show yeah that was fun that was fun that was i, nice. I randomly i randomly was uh <laughs> you know because i don't really do a lot of preparation whether it's tv or this but I actually ran into Pat Martin's interview recently and I was literally laughing the whole entire time. You know, obviously he's one of my best friends and uh, he's just the greatest character, you know? I amazing. love, I could listen to him all <laughs> day long. It was texting time. me, it was texting me last night at like a ridiculous hour. Well, started at 1240 AM just to tell me he loved me. <laughs> oh, that's I awesome. mean. That we have this thing where like no need to reply just thinking of you love you <laughs> that's great he's that's... he's um he's such a good guy but i think people don't understand he's like a really good business person like we reach Brilliant. out to him and he he's a mentor to us in a lot of ways but um when we were growing our business you know we really used him as a, a resource and he made himself very accessible to us and he's just such a generous person yeah i agree completely um you know I helped him open his restaurant, the big one in Nashville. And I actually, in help, I helped him with the food stuff, like, you know, how to cook a brisket, right. And all this stuff. But mm -hmm. I learned so much more from him on the business side um, than I got out of it, teaching him how to cook some barbecue and different styles than he's normally accustomed to doing. So, um, but where, you know, me, him and Sam are the three stooges, as you know, and uh, <laughs> um, we, we, uh, we act in accordingly and but uh but but pat has helped countless people and he never talks about it mm. um, yeah uh, when people come to me for advice i obviously help help as much as i can but when it comes to like 
growing brands and stuff like that, I always, I always um, put them on to Pat because Pat is really an expert. You know, people don't know that Pat was in finance before he was in barbecue. And, uh, and his I dad, didn't know that. Yeah. His dad was in finance but, for many, many years as a banker. Yeah. Um, so that as much makes as a lot Pat, of sense. Yeah, it does. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Pat, Pat's a very unique. He has a very, he has a lot of hats that he wears and he's very smart and um, very unique. And, you know, obviously we all love him. Yeah. And he, he it's, a, it's just a special straight shooter. Like there's certain people and like you're, you're a straight shooter. There's certain people that, you know, when you talk to them that you're going to get the truth and you're going to get the hard truth. If you, oh and, yeah. And there's That's a lot the only of way we know how to do it. Me and Pat, Pat, Pat and I were getting interviewed on live on a live show in Nashville. And the, the host said, <laughs> and the host said, Hey, I know all you barbecue guys have, uh, have, secrets or secret recipes and at the same time me and pat said secrets are for assholes it's hilarious uh, i was i was just listening to your cat kinsman communal table podcast oh, that was and, great. i bookmarked that yeah last night. she's she's great but yeah. i love that you guys reference the secrets like no uh, amy mills said something about you know there's just no room for secrets you're not going to make it far nobody's nobody's going to really take you seriously if, if you're not willing to be open because that's what this community is it's just a bunch of people that want to get together talk about what they're doing, help each other out and have fun and occasionally drink some wine and beer. That's it. I mean, it's sim that simple. And that's why a lot of people are angry when Aaron wrote his book. And I, I actually, you know, Aaron and I are quite close and I, I, I called and if anyone's close to Aaron, I don't know if anyone's really, <laughs> truly close. But, uh, yes, yeah, indeed. Um, yeah, indeed. And, but, 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 I, but I, I, I sent him a note and said, you know, I'm so proud that you, you know, gave so much of yourself. I mean, there were several people at that time when that book came out that basically cooked the exact same way as Aaron. I, to be quite honest, I'm one of them. Aaron built the smokers I used at the time. So we both used Creekstone Farms briskets. We both used the same seasonings. Everything was pretty much the same. But I love that he opened it up to the world because... There's one thing to tell you how to do it and give you the pots and pans that he uses, if you will, but to do it is a whole nother thing, you know, mm -hmm. and, the, yeah. and the folks that take that manifesto and, and, and run with it. I, I mean, I think it's just extraordinary that our, uh, extraordinary uh, graciousness that he would literally, you know, all the time, blood, sweat and tears, he would he would uh, open that up to the world. And I, I thought it was brilliant. Patrick always says my Patrick always says like the, we don't have any secrets and I can tell you exactly how I do everything, but there's a lot of hard work that goes into it. And we all know that. And that's, I think that's the little variant that if your brisket's not turning out right or something, it might just be that you weren't, you know, you didn't put in all the work. You didn't do it for 18 years before you finally, you know, got it right. There's years and years and years of trial and error that goes behind Aaron Franklin and goes behind you know, hometown barbecue and, and everybody that's doing it. And uh, recipes are great and recipes are, are part of what we do, but it's like the the day-to-day -day experience that really makes our barbecue what it is. Yeah, exactly. And and who knew too, like 20 years ago, 30 years ago, that this community would exist the way that it does. It was a much different community. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, the, the amount of just think of the amount every, everyone on this, uh, you know, this, this pod right now, the amount of cooks we've done for charities and, 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 and so many people in need, um, the barbecue community, you know, Mike Mills, uh, I get emotional now talking about Mike, but, mm -hmm. you know, Mike taught us all how to be better people. And he, he had the famous line. He said, you know, the, the, the spaghetti people don't do what we do. Mm -hmm. and come together like we do and um and really and really give of each other and fully and you know the barbecue community rally rally around each other uh with such with just grace and 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 elegance and it's just incredible how much uh, goodwill we get to do together i had like one or two voicemails from mike that unfortunately i didn't i, I never saved and i always thought man that would be my most treasured mm -hmm. uh, one of my most treasured uh things of all time just to be able to hear his voice when I wanted to because it was so unique as we all know I've never I've had many a glass of wine with you um at barbecue events but I've never really known from your perspective what how you got into wine and what that path kind of looked like for you 
what got what piqued your interest uh, every year in new york you know new york city there's certain really good things about living here and one of them is the fact that we have three or four main wine assaults on the city every year one is called la fete which is obviously the champagne um all the great champagne makers uh, from around champagne in france come in um, then La Pole, which 85 of the best winemakers from Burgundy come in. And then um, there's La Table, where I cook with Daniel Balud and Daniel Eddy for the Rhone event uh, every year. And then um, so early on, you know, I've always I always dabbled in drinking wine where I grew up. I mean, it wasn't really prevalent. We drank, you know, Guinness and whiskey and or mm-hmm. Bud and whiskey or whatever. Uh, but um, but, you know, the, 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 the other people in the neighborhood, you know, you see them drinking wine, but it would be crazy stuff like Super Tuscans or Dom Perignon and, and stuff like that, you know, and I couldn't relate to any of those things, obviously, um, being an Irish kid from Flatbush, you know, so, um, but I would say about eight or nine years ago, I really, really started to get into sour beer and cider. Mm-hmm. And I think sour beer kind of, um, there were so many great brewmasters here in New York right now and around the country. I mean, yeah. Texas has some ex- insane beer right now. But I started to drink sour beer and sour beer led me into like the more like, like pet nats, which led me into kind of really um, being part of the charge of this like really biodynamic natural wine craze that was really getting, getting here in New York uh, eight or nine years ago. And then I always thought the wines from Burgundy and Bordeaux and and stuff like that were just too far out of my reach. I always thought the winemakers were probably well-to-do people, which coats and ties. And then the first year we held the luncheon for the 85 uh, Burgundians to uh, at hometown. So they got in a big bus. They come to hometown. We do a lunch with like a, you know, bluegrass band and, you know, you know, they're, they're drinking uh, Brooklyn lagers and whatever, you know, Brooklyn beers. And every one of them was like a humble uh, woman or man who were just had like still had dirt under their fingernails, basically. Yeah. And just I just really learned that they were just farmers, that they were hardworking farmers. And, you know, they didn't really set the prices on some of the wines that were coming in. Obviously, taxation, we could talk about that craziness of the, how expensive wines are, but I was I I was able to to really say, holy, these are these are just simple uh, women and men who are hardworking and they're in the farms and they're and they're you know they're experts in this in this this world of viticulture and I just want to know more about their stories, and I befriended some really prominent winemakers who were like, you know, heroes to me that they didn't know. And, but I had an audience and I got to speak with them and learn from them uh, just that one day. And I would say that one day changed my life forever. And they went on to their bus, you know, unaffected by maybe meeting me, but it was a, it was a huge, huge um, impact in my life um, learning uh, about them and then, you know, reading about their stories and their journeys. Um, And I love the, you know, uh, one of the wines I have here was, um, you know, there's five wines that basically were an epiphany to me. And one of them was this wine from Spain um, in Panetas in Catalonia called Els Hillipins. And I was in London when I was drinking that wine um, at a really great restaurant in London. And first of all, I was really impressed by the bottle. It's just a completely black, I can show you the bottle. Yeah. Yeah, it's, just a, it's just a completely black bottle and it has this little um, yeah. painting and the painting is the vintage. Um uh, it, it describes the vintage and the color of it will describe which wine it is, whether it's, um, you know, white rosé or, or, or macerated. So, so I, I found out that it was a, it was a mom and daughter uh, who made these wines in this tiny little village in, in, in Catalonia. And, you know, and the wine was just, I mean, I got hairs standing up on my arms when I drank it. And it was so interesting to me that, you know, these two, women were just you know farming the farms by themselves basically um so i took a deep dive into those wines and stuff like that but but i would say the bur- the, the the meeting all the winemakers from burgundy and then being you know having the knowledge to 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 seek out these really special wines that are made by b- very special people so the mother daughter relationships the husband wife relationships the you know the you know Mujer et Giborg that has three sisters that run um, their 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 domain in Burgundy and now all the their daughters yeah. are now going to be taking over. That's you know, amazing. Uh, 
Uh, Dominic Lafon uh, from Burgundy is just gave over the reins to his vineyard, to his daughter. So the amount of women winemakers that are that are in um, the world right now making superior wines is just at an all time high. And um, and I'm really fond of the styles. I think there's a there is a crazy grace and femininity, femininity to an elegance to some of the wines that I drink and just happen to be made by women winemakers. And it's it's kind of strange that they have that appeal. That resonates a lot with me and the style of wines that I like. So I think we like similar styles because when we when you bring wines to events, they're either wines I've heard of um, and have tried or sometimes I've heard of and I haven't tried them. So I'm like super excited. Els Helpins is one that I used to pour um, we had a bottle of it on the menu at Camerata, which is a wine bar that I worked at a few years ago. And it was always only available by the bottle. We never poured it by the glass. And I just kept waiting for somebody to order it because when people would order the high end stuff like that, they would always let the bartenders have a sip, like, oh, pour yourself a little. And right. I got to try it. And I agree with you. It is a beautiful wine. I didn't know that it was a, a uh, mom and daughter. I knew it was a female, but I didn't know that it was a mom and daughter. Um, but I love, love that story. And I just, the people behind the wine are everything. And yeah. that's the yeah, It's all about same. the stories for me. It's all about the stories. Yeah. I mean, the, wine becomes, the wine becomes, I know the wine's going to be sound and beautiful just by the story sometimes. And there's no way to hide behind the story. I mean, and now, and I, so I said that there was like a Trinity before in the pre thing when we were talking and drinking wine is one thing, reading about wine is another thing, but you know what? You got to get on a plane. You have to, you have to go eat the dirt yeah. in, in Beaujolais and you have to go eat the dirt in Austria and you have to go eat the dirt in Catalonia and you have to really walk through the vineyards and really understand what they're working with. And, you know, um, I don't really have opinions anymore about natural wines or, you know, as long as, you know, I have certain criteria, obviously in the wines that I drink and I admire, you know, but I got to visit so many great wineries recently in Champagne and, and Burgundy. And it's just, it's just that element of being, a, and there, and people are so kind and gracious. You know, I found so many beautiful wines that, that, that are so rare. So, you know, I, you go to these great places like Rumier and DRC and Rouleau and Dujac and you go to all these fancy places but you know some of the most important impactful um, and they're all very impactful don't get me wrong you know particularly in my visit at Dujac but then I, you know I, I met a guy named Jacques Marc Jean-Marc Vincent from Santenay and Santenay is this tiny little town in, in Burgundy and uh, Jean-Marc and, and uh, it was so crazy because we went there and it was so cold and it was the winter time and John Mark's wife picks us up in this tiny little car and there's like five of us and we could barely squeeze and fit in the car. The old Billy definitely couldn't have fit in that car. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, but we, um, but she, she took us around and drove us through this little town and one of their plots of land is next to a casino. It's just so random. And, you know, you think of these wines with such grandeur and, mm -hmm, of course. Um, and, uh, and I didn't understand why I have a town of a thousand people that needed a casino there, but whatever, you know, but it was just so funny that one of their vineyard pots was next to a casino. But then you go to the house and John Mark Vincent is this, you know, little passionate guy and where every single tasting is a barrel tasting right out of the barrel. And um, the wines were so vibrant and, and, and important and, and of, of intention and purpose. And you can't deny when you're drinking a wine of that, of that intention and that purpose and that drive, um, all the hard work that went into it, you know? Um, I think there's two things, right? There's farmers and then there's winemakers and they kind of meet in the middle somewhere and uh, their, their skill sets meet in the middle somewhere. And, but Jean-Marc Vincent is just a one man, you know, wrecking ball of amazing wines and so proud of what they do and, and stuff like that so it's fun yeah. to find it's great to go to these big domains you know and um and stuff but it's really it's really the most treasured ones of these finding these little gems that you know i wasn't aware of before i got to burgundy how, yeah. how, would, how would someone like me and i apologize for interrupting but if yeah. someone like me if i wanted to go to burgundy and that region how how would i set it with is there some like is it through other people that you set up these visits or is it something that you can just go yeah well for Aaron and I as a layman for Aaron and I it's a little more easy because we would normally go through our purveyors um and a lot of the purveyors that we buy the wine through if we're buying those wines 
mm-hmm. um, are happy to set up visits for us, like at you know um, La Fleve and like all those visits. Some of them are friends of mine now because of this, sure. because of me cooking and with them. And, and you know, I've cooked at La Pole, I've cooked at La Table, so I be, befriended some of them. So that's one way. And then it's just knowing somebody. I mean, I can e- easily call for you if you wanted yeah. to go to some of these visits. Um, I didn't even know Jean-Marc Vincent was on our on our itinerary until the last minute. And I didn't even know the wines. I didn't know who he was. Uh, and it turned out to be like one of the most inspirational visits. So I think I think it's easy. It's easier than you think mm-hmm. to get access to it. It's not like Napa where you just go and you pay for a tour or something like that. You know, this this is like you're in these people's homes. My, you know, my one of my favorite, uh, I'm, it's no secret that I'm an obsessed champagne lover. And, um, you know, one of my favorite, my favorite visit of all time was with uh, a really, treasured young winemaker named Cedric Bouchard, who um, I think makes some of the most unique, interesting wines in the world. And he was my first visit when I got to Champagne this year. And I got literally got off the plane, car drove me to to his house, basically. And I spent uh, what was to be a 45 minute visit, six hours, basically, in, in Cedric's home, uh, first in his cave and then his home. Um, and he was so generous. He opened up seven different bottles um not bottles that he'd normally test test with everybody he just let he let our group basically pick any cuvee and uh, any vintage including his original vintage and then sat and just spent time with his family and and you know so some of these visits become lifelong friendships too and Cedric's so interesting because his fermentation process with with how he what he does to engage the wine because so Cedric's famous for being the only uh, champagne, ma- a small grower champagne maker that wants you to decant his wines. A lot of this, I would have learned in, in, in when in traveling through champagne is a lot of the champagne makers really um, don't like bubbles, which is very odd because yeah, that's the, the entire concept. But what is so much more strange about Cedric Bouchard is Cedric pays painstakingly uh, uh, creates fine, 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 really effervescent wines which is hard to do. It has to do with a, a way colder fermentation process. And, and essentially then wants to decant the wines or drink, open them and drink them the following day. So they're absolutely flat and still. Um, so it's so crazy. Uh, so he's such a genius that he wants to make these wines the best they can be made with this fermentation process. But then this disregards the process basically to want to drink his wine still. Um, and I think what I've learned drinking champagne is I do like the effervescence, but I also do have a really fond appreciation now for still champagnes that I like. Um, there's a, a bottle of um, uh, Baresh from Ambene here. And like this wine from Raphael Baresh, this is mm-hmm. Baresh, which is pretty common, small grower. Um, and like Marie Corten, who Dominique, who, who we also visited in Champagne, uh, is making some of the most interesting biodynamic wines. But they like to drink their wines still. And I think it's very interesting. The fruit is so much more intense when the wines yeah. are still. Um, so I just, it's just learning. But the, anyway, that Trinity part, you have to get on a plane. You have to travel. You have to meet the winemakers. And you have to like literally eat the soil. Except yeah. in Chablis. Don't eat the soil. <laughs> so you talk a lot about champagne and I I studied your wine list a little bit and I'm fascinated by how much a tavern real estate. Yeah, the, how much real estate you dedicate to champagne and then you you organize it by subregion. That's right. Um, which I think is great. And since we don't talk a lot about champagne on the podcast, I think now it's like a really good time to kind of talk about just some of the big broad focal points about champagne. So champagne has four main subregions and then a fifth smaller subregion. That's right. Um, and the the three grapes that are used predominantly are Chardonnay, uh, Pinot Noir, and Pinot Minouet. And each little subregion kind of has its preference in uh, which grapes they're using and growing. And it has a lot to do with climate and soil type and what, what does well in that area. So I love that your menu is, is designed that way because a lot of times when we're doing champagne labels, it doesn't say what the grapes are. It doesn't, they usually don't have vintages. And if they do, that's fairly rare and uncommon. Um, so a lot of the information is in the knowledge. So the subregions yeah. can tell you a lot, can tell you what the grape probably is. 
Correct. Um, and sometimes they can tell you a little bit about the method, even though most of them use like the traditional method. No, I think, I I think that's what really got me into champagne first is just the arduous process of, of how to make champagne is, is, pretty, is pretty amazing. You know, I got to disgorge bottles when I was there, which was, was pretty, I'm pretty terrible at to be quite honest with you. <laughs> um, I, I took a bath in champagne as I disgorged the wines. But, you know, I think, I think just the fact that, you know, I mean, I do, I do drink a couple big grower champagnes like Krug and, and Dom and, and, and those things. But to me, there's nothing like drinking a small grower champagne from, uh, I mean, this just has to be from Ambonet, which is, is, uh, is um, partial to that, that plot. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a Grand Cru plot. This is a 16 millisimi. Um, but I, I think, I think the process in general is really interesting with, you know, um, with the with double fermentations and do you dosage, do you not dosage, like, uh, you know, all, all those things. I, I just think I, I'm, I'm always of someone, that's why I love barbecue. That's how I got into barbecue yeah. process, the science. Uh, I don't, I really, you can, I could put up a, a shoe in the smoker and it'll somehow taste good if I do everything right scientifically, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. um, you know, creating thermodynamics and airflow and all the things we now know about. Um, but, but, but winemaking is, is there is the science to the winemaking, but the farming there's not because mm-hmm. you are at the mercy of everything else around you, as we all know, yeah. with whether, you know, um, a perfect example right now, uh, you know, we were drinking some great wine from Jura last night and the Jura has taken a beat and it's, been ravished by bad weather and hail and all these you know all these things yeah. um, so those winemakers aren't i don't even know if they made wine in 2021 or 2020 or something like that i mean so there's there's that and it's the risk and living on the edge and and so yes everything could be manipulated to whatever it needs to be with some of these big con, you know conventional winemakers and the beauty of drinking wine made by someone who just cares about you know, I mean, there's a lot, a lot of debate about the word terroir, but I actually am someone who really believes in the terroir because again, I hate the dirt. So I, I relate to, um, to how those things taste. But in Champagne, I think, I think it's most unique because they are dealing with, uh, it's a different kind of land. It's obviously, it's, it's mainly flat. So everyone's kind of on a, on a level playing field, if you will. And then, you know, it really, it really, you know, the weather, the, with weather with the weather being what it is and you know in bug infestations and all that stuff mites and stuff coming in really what really what happens in champagne is um when it gets to when it gets to the process of making the wine the science of making the wine it's really it's really when is you you see the individuality of the winemaker so champagne in france is the winemaking region that's furthest to the north and relies heavily on cooler climates. That's correct. Um, and and I think you'd be a good person to talk to about this since you have such a, a close relationship with producers in the region. Are they being affected right now by global or climate change, warming temperatures? Yeah, I mean, definitely yes, definitely yes. I think this is something that it will be, I mean, I have something to say about it, but I think this is something that Raj will really have a lot of really you know, you know, on the ground experience with, I think they know it's there. I think they recognize it. I think they're addressing it in, in, in some ways. Um, but I think, I still think that most of these winemakers are just, we're going to take what we get year by year and we're going to do our best with what comes at us year by year until they can. Yeah. Anymore. There are a lot of things that they are doing to try to prevent the speed of it. Um, but again, I, I wouldn't call myself an expert in any way in, in that. And I, and, you know, I know, I know you have um, a guest who will be coming up <laughs> yeah. the, 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 the foremost thought leader on, on that process. But I, w- I but I will say from, from a firsthand talking with them about it, cause it's a very, uh, it's a topic that everyone's speaking about right now. Um, they are obviously clearly aware of it and they are trying to have preventative measures for it. Um, but yeah, it's very difficult. I found yeah. that I found the, I found some interesting ways, not necessarily with that, um, but with you know, with how, what what they're spraying with now in in France and Italy, and um, I mean that it changes between those two regions, but um, but how they're spraying and how they're they're plowing the fields and and what they're doing, you know, uh, 
you know, they're, they're always trying to get to the next, the next thing. Um, Simo, uh, Cheese of Bees, who makes uh, Simone Bees, you know, Simone Bees is a very popular uh, uh, brand in Bur a very popular domain in, in Burgundy. Um, and Cheese of Bees is the woman who makes that wine. And, you know, she's definitely on the cutting edge of, of what I think is, is um, coming up with new and creative ways to farm her land, you know, including, as yeah. you probably know already, you know, using whey and, um, instead of copper and, you know, all these things. So, I mean, I, I think it's, I think it's quite interesting that they're always trying to get ahead of it. And so yeah, they're trying to look out five, 10 years from now, just to kind yeah, of, yeah. now I, I've, I wanted to ask because there's a lot of people that don't drink champagne or just have it once on new year's for some random reason. Yeah. Can you explain why you love champagne and what you feel like it works with? And then I saw recently, I think Andrew and Michelle, Munoz from Moose Craft Barbecue visited with you and yeah. you ended their trip with some bubbly. And I, so I, I wanted to kind of get into yeah, that. Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. They're, they're wonderful people, by yes, the way, um, just an amazing family. And um, I'm so happy that they're getting their due right now. Um, you know, again, the process to me and the science behind making champagne is quite interesting, but I always saw when, you know, everything, a lot of things, I'm a very visual person. So a lot of people, um, you know, that I grew up around, you know, would be popping great bottles of champagne for celebratory things. Yeah. And when I started to, that's how I, I guess, would open a bottle of wine here and there. But as I, as I become, became more knowledgeable about, you know, the, the, the winemakers in the regions, I just became more interested and, you know, I think the thing about champagne is it changes in the glass from the time you open the bottle, you know, most wines do, but from for champagne particularly, because, you know, it loses its chill and tastes different and it loses its effervescence at some point and it tastes different. So I love wines that are always changing while I'm drinking them. And I think that happens quite often with champagne. And I think, you know, when you're dealing with Pinot Noir or, um, you know, Nebbiolo, or there, there are definitely different ways to make that. Some more elegant, some more pretty, some more structured, some more tannic, all those things. But I think with champagne, there, to me, it's more nuanced for some reason. I, when I drink it, like I can, you know, is it orchard fruit? Is it cherries? Is it, you know, I'm always finding something that's, that's, that I missed the last time. And I could drink six bottles of the same wine. And I'm always, finding something new about it and I guess that's true of all wines but there's something really unique about champagne and and the 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 way it travels um, while you drink it you feel like you could drink it at any time yeah I don't drink I drink it yeah I, want, I don't want to put myself <laughs> off pretty daily you know so <laughs> yeah but it's yeah, not just I mean, like I don't, I don't, see, I don't understand the, the celebratory yeah, nature yeah, yeah. of drinking champagne only. It just doesn't make any sense. Maybe to me. it was a good sales technique for. Well, that's uh, that's precisely what it was for sure. Um, and you know, everything was around the celebration of, of of wine in that sense. And champagne was so much different because of the the um, the process and the and the, the effervescence of it. But I don't know, to me, it's just bright and fresh and acidic, and it could be it could be that if it's Blanc to Blanc and crispy and clean and, or if it's, you know, I love Pinot Noir champagnes particularly. So, you know, those are totally different. And I think, and then, you know, when you drink a wine, um, you know, it's all time and place, you know? So, you know, I don't want to drink a big, rich textured bottle of Krug um, in, in a hot summer day, you know, out when my friends eat oysters, I want to eat, I want to drink some crispy, crazy, clean Blanc to Blanc. Chardonnay. Um, so I think it's time and place. And I think it's, you know, I think, I think the, the journey that you go through when you drink champagne is what, what, what piques my curiosity. You know, it's interesting because we talk about like, there's got to be some kind of marketing behind champagne because we, as a, as Americans, we think of champagne as celebratory. Um, but a lot of the wine professionals that I know don't even drink champagne in a wine flute. You know, I never. I, I, we we serve it out of a regular wine glass and AP same. glass, AP glass. Yeah. So the whole the flute and all of the like the ceremony that surrounds champagne, I think, is very. Not only is it very American, but I I think it's very much really good marketing by somebody that was trying to break into like the American market. 
a long well, time ago. That's a hundred percent how it started for sure. Yeah. yeah that's, that's, that's for sure. Yeah. I've never drank with a wine drinker that drinks champagne out of a fluid. I think it's absolutely bizarre. It makes no <laughs> yeah. sense whatsoever. <laughs> about just this, just this year, you can't smell it. You can't get it, you know, your mouth around it. You can't do anything. So, but yeah, yeah. so, so yeah, it, it was, it was definitely a, a marketed strategy, strategic way to, to sell champagne, but you know, I, I just love it all the time. And not, you know, listen, I love all wine. So, but, but I definitely, I definitely think champagne is, is definitely one of those, you know, it could pair with literally everything. Aldo Sam, who's, who's basically a, a wine man, my wine mentor and a dear friend of mine. I, I even spoke to him yesterday and he has, I will say this and I don't give plugs to anybody. That's not true, but I, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm protective of who I give him, but his, his book, um i think is for any because i get dozens and dozens of dozens monthly of people barbecue people which i think you'll find exciting aaron and kevin i I, that want to know like how that that follow uh, the instagram or something and they want to know like how can they get an entry to wine i'm sure it happens with you all the time aaron so yeah uh, and you know i and i engage every person i don't i you know i answer every every dm or text or whatever it is and, uh, you know, I always end up um, telling them to get all those book called Wine Simple. And to me, it's the most, you know, Aldo was nominated the greatest sommelier in the world twice. Um, he is a brilliant mind and he wrote the most easy to read on wine book that you can ever imagine. And I, I just think I just think that is you know, for all the people listening who want yeah. to have an entry into wine, the book Wine Simple is really like if you will, the manifesto on how to, how to just know the basics from everything from all the grapes to the processes, but it's, it's like really colorful and easy to read. And then it has, Hey, I walk into a wine shop. How the heck do I find a bottle of wine? I walk yeah, into a restaurant. I'm intimidated by a wine list. How do I do that? Yeah, no, that's- I was, that's how I got into wine too, by just talking to friends. Cause I was intimidated by these books that were this big. Yeah. And I just didn't know where to look and what to do. And my wine epiphany. I still am. Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I get intimid- less and less, but yes, I still am word. sometimes. Yeah. yeah, I am sometimes. And it's funny because I'm normally the one at the table picking wines. And then when I'm with some other folks, I'm not, you know, yeah. and um, we all have a mutual respect for each other and, and our knowledge. But, you know, I know when to stop and shut up and listen instead of talking. And, and, and that's how I really learn is when I'm out there and, you know, I'm curious, I have, you know, everybody likes what they like. So, you know, I have friends who drink ice cold Syrah. They yeah. just, you know, no one else <laughs> would drink Syrah ice cold, but these are two intense winemakers. Uh, my friends, I can say their names, Patrick Capiello and Pac Patel. They, they make great wines out in California. Um, but, you know, they're famous, you know, or infamous, both of them on drinking ice cold Syrah. And now I also like to drink ice cold Syrah. Interesting. Um, we're, we're actually about to have a dinner at Red Hook Tavern with Patrick on June 22nd. Um, oh, cool. And it's a, it's an all Thierry Alamond, which is probably the most famous producer. Um, and I'm sure all those bottles will be very expensive bottles of wine and be ice cold. But, um, you know, everybody likes what they like. And I think it's most yeah. interesting sometimes just to sit back and, and really and really listen and learn. But, but anyway, the wine simple is just a, is a, is a really a good way to learn how to yeah, it's really, it's really, gonna, and I'll put a link below for people that way they can. Order yeah, themselves. yeah. But I mean, I mean, you, you're gonna be super shocked. I love the fact that it's like how to un- be non intimidated by a wine store when you walk into. I used to walk into wine shops even when I, I was drinking, you know, starting to drink a lot of wine, and I'd just be so intimidated. And I'd say, oh, like I'm trying to think of all the things I knew to talk about with the wine people, and then I was just like, you know what? Let me just listen and just you know yeah. see what they have to say and Aldo breaks that down for you like you know so you're not intimidated my wine epiphany actually happened in Oslo Norway and I was really intimidated I had been drinking wine for a few years now and had you know gone through I thought I knew what I was talking about and I was at this restaurant called Mimo which is a pretty famous restaurant and the book came out like this and the sommelier was like <laughs> really you know intensely knowledgeable clearly and um <laughs> and I called Aldo from my seat. I was with this guy named Daniel Krieger, who's a very well-known food photographer. And oh yeah, yeah, uh, great stuff. Time. Yeah, yeah, really. Yeah, good. so Daniel's one of my best friends, and Daniel was uh, 
we were actually out in Sweden, Aaron, at Holy, uh, you know, this, the, you know, doing yeah, the, Holy oh, I, I, right. Yeah. We were doing the thing at Holy Spirit. And then uh, I wanted to fly out to see the church that my grandmother was baptized in, in Norway, in this little place called drama in Norway. So Daniel's like, Oh, I'm coming for that. And we did. And that's another story, but, um, but we were in the memo and, and the book came and I was like, so intimidated. I was nervous. So I, was, I called Aldo. And at the time I was like, Holy shit. I'm calling one of the greatest sommeliers from one of the greatest restaurants in the world to get a wine recommendation. I said, and Daniel's like, man, I think you made it. <laughs> yeah, that's like a moment. Like an, an, and I was like, oh, man. yeah, you're right. I, I can't believe I have this, this, this guy to call. So he said, Billy, listen, you're such a confident guy. Just sit back in your seat, point to anything that says Rulo and they'll think, you know, everything you need to know about what you're talking about. I never drank, <laughs> I never drank Rulo before. Rulo is a very prominent winemaker in, in Burgundy. Very, very interesting story. He was an actor from Paris. Um, his family had this incredible vineyard uh, in Merceau and, you know, through Burgundy. And uh, I just put my finger down on 2011 Luchette's and that was it. I literally smelled the wine, drank the wine and every single hair on my my arm stood up. <laughs> I had this, oh. I had like a, like this crazy thing come over me. And, and that my journey started that, that moment that day. And yeah. it's been crazy since then. What was your wine epiphany, Aaron? Did you have one at all? Or was it just, what, what do you think it was? Was there a wine? Or? Yeah, that's a good. Well, so my wine epiphany kind of happened when I was, um, I was cooking in New York. I left, I had just left per se because I got a job working for a place called Italian Wine Merchants, which was owned by Mario Batali. And it was, at, and then I also eventually went and worked at, at Babo for Mario and wine was really starting to become this bigger part of my culinary journey. Don't say Gaia, it's just a Kaya. Well, Gaia was a big part of, I, I wouldn't say that I had this big epiphany. I drank Gaia um, actually quite a bit at Italian Wine Merchants because we would open it for private events. Yeah. And so, but it certainly when you taste wine that's of that caliber, I mean, it, it really kind of, fr from a culinary background, you just think like the perfection and you know, you think you know what went into it. And the reality is we, we, we don't because it's such hard work, the farming and the winemaking and everything. Um, but being surrounded by wine and really being fascinated by the wine growing part of it, like, so what you were talking about, like the viticulture, I almost went to... Uh, Joe Bastianich's vineyard in Friuli, um, which is like an intern program that they had where it was room and board covered and you would work a harvest. And um, I was all gung ho about doing that. Sent an email, never heard back. Talked to Joe about it. He was like, oh, okay, I'll, you know, I'll talk to the person that's in charge of that and make sure you get in. Never got any emails, just kind of let it go and thought maybe they just, you know, I, maybe it wasn't cut out. For me and uh turns out it was just like hitting my spam inbox um uh, like like a deep like, like a does. deep layers of the spam because i definitely did search my spam but i found the emails years later but it's really kind of sparked an interest in me and i was really into the science of it because i have a biology background and a biochemistry i majored in biology and minored in biochem and the science of wine is fascinating to me so there's the farming side and then there's the winemaking side um and in the wine world they call it viticulture and viniculture and I thought the viniculture stuff was very fascinating because it was piquing all of my interests with chemistry and science and um, the whole fermentation process which you know you can you can put it on a blackboard with like a formula that has three parts to it but in reality it's just like barbecue each part of that formula has a thousand variables right. um whether elements would uh product you know everything <coughs> everything right. what is it in is it tank and for uh you know yeah. Ed, you know yeah yeah all of that yeah it's interesting and so you know i i've always been really interested in it since kind of having that understanding of wine um and living in new york at the time there was just limitless uh, exposure to really great products, really great producers. Um, a lot of the biggest importers in the country are in New York. Um, so you're just basically like at the, you're at the front door to yeah. 
old style, you know, old world wines and and things that are coming into this country from from elsewhere. Do things and, do things come to New York and not make it all the way out for West Coast? Does I don't happen? think that that happens so much, but I think like Texas, for example, is we're definitely not getting everything. And part of it is that has a lot to do with TABC law, the way we tax things, um, and then just where the market demand is. Uh, so Houston is evolving and Texas is evolving, but I think for a long time, a lot of the wines coming in wouldn't have really moved very well here. Um, the market just wasn't kind of caught up to it yet. Uh, but now I think that's not the case. I definitely think there's a market for all of that wine. I mean, I've been talking a lot about, you know, pretty cult, more expensive wine producers, but I think what's most, you know, we're most proud of it with the Lifted Tavern is you can get a really serious bottle of wine for 40 bucks too. And, yeah. you know, or you, you know, there's extremes the other way, but when we were, when we were initially doing the wine list, you know, the original wine list was done by me and a guy named Jeff Porter, who's, who actually ran the Batali Bastianich um, yeah, I was say, I wine know that program guy. <laughs> for many, many, many years. And Jeff's one of my dearest friends. And um, he's from the hill country of Texas, by the way. Um, I did not know that. I didn't know that. Easily, easily, he'd be an interesting interview. He's easily um, one of the foremost thought leaders on Italian wine, maybe in the world, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Um, And when you travel to Italy uh, with Jeff, it's like traveling with the Pope. It's really pretty incredible how these, you know, whether it's Contano or Bartolo Muscarello or all these major, you know, winemakers just really uh, Vietti, they just open the door for them and, and just, you're, you know, anything you need, any vintages you want to drink, any, you know, just incredible. And then the amount of knowledge you learn from obviously those winemakers is another level, but, but Jeff and I did it. We drank over 600 bottles, tasted over 600 <laughs> bottles of, not drank, uh, tasted over 600 bottles of wine. We get down to 165, which is the original list at a tavern. Uh, and then, you know, I hired a uh, wine director who, you know, started to, um, you know, put his own craft, you know, little uh, take on on the wine list. And then about a year and a half ago, about a year and a few months ago, um, this gal who is a, a sommelier at 11 Madison Park named Rebecca Flynn wow. <clears throat> came and really made the wine list more balanced and rounded and better uh, than I did just added things that were missing and you know maybe edited some stuff that maybe shouldn't have been on and now the wine list is probably at, is simmering at around 200 bottles or something like that but um, but it's really really well well balanced you know we, we are like one of the restaurants that people come to and know they're not going to get crushed on pricing of wine um, where, you know, there's places in New York City that charge 5X on a bottle of wine. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, and then obviously it's different for the wines we sell. We're about to just change all the BTG wines at Hometown. Um, um, as we speak after this, I'm going to go to a meeting and, um, and I'm meeting, I'm tasting wines today um, with a bunch of purveyors to, to change the wine list um, at Hometown, which Jeff and I did that wine list as well. Uh, originally and we went for it I had two euro yeah. cobs massive euro cobs in the middle of the dining room in the, in the smokehouse uh, we had about 30 by the bottles options and 12 by the glass options at one point at a, <laughs> at a barbecue that's restaurant that's a big but, wine list for a barbecue restaurant yeah, Billy, Billy, really... be, before that burgundy epiphany did you have wine on the wine list at all yeah so when we open hometown that. barbecue we have a we have a winery um in Red Hook called Red Hook Winery. And, uh, you know, those grapes are, you know, those, some of those wines are made, you know, in the North Fork and, um, uh, well, the farming is done there. And then the winemaking is made uh, in Red Hook. So what we used to do is my friend, Darren Palace, who's just an amazing guy who actually works with Raj, um, and Dwayne Wade on his wines, um, Oh. Darren used to be the the manager of the winery, and I would bring mass, I would bring Magnum and Jero bombs, <laughs> and he siphon the wine out of the barrel into the bottles. And we own, that's the only wine we sold when we first opened was wine from Red Hook Winery that we siphoned into the bottle. We'd get like a um, a shopping cart. Uh, cork all the wines and then roll them back to hometown <laughs> two blocks away. Uh, and I was really proud of that at the time. I mean, I, I didn't know a ton about wine. You know, that was not 
nine, 10 years ago. So, you know, I, I knew a tiny bit, but not, not much. And then, you know, a year or two later is when I really went deep diving into this thing. But, but you know what, those were some of the fun, fun, fun times. And those wines were actually really sound and beautiful. And, um, and I was proud that we were, that we were representing the Red Hook winery and, um, and the yeah. wines. Um, yeah. So, so that's how, it, that's how the wine program, that's started, interesting. That's curious, program yeah. started, if you will, there was about, five magnum five magnums and a gero bomb of just any table red wine or whatever you can find and then we'd buy um you know uh one sparkling wine uh, and one you know rosé or something like that it wasn't it was very uh yeah it was it was very grassroots from there but 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 when we went for it we went for it it was like god bless you we like bless over you. 600 wines we tasted um that was a lot of fun but it got my palate really understanding how to drink a, like or taste a lot of wine. Um, you know, we were doing 12, you know, no, about 10 visits a day sometimes, which is, and as Aaron could That's a lot. That is a lot of visits. Um, and, you know, figure some of the visits are six to eight bottles sometimes yeah. at least. So we, uh, we got to taste a lot of wines and I'd say, you know, um, it was very difficult narrowing them down. Um, but, you know, we were we were super proud of it um, and yeah so we had it and then the pandemic hit and it just never it just never really found its way back um you know people were like we were open only outdoors and um, even in the summertime you know people wanted to drink canned wine and we found some really good alternatives that were really well-made wines that were in a can um yeah. and that were drinking really good and the customers really loved those that's my girl you know jordan Hell yeah. She's, she's my girl too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah Aaron and I were talking about her a couple of days ago. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we sell, we sell that at, at, at hometown. And um, I, I just actually saw Jordan recently. Um, Ellen, Ellen Bennett um, came in oh. um, to Brooklyn with the, with the little nugget, the little baby with and Nico. The family, yeah, little Nico and the family. And she had a, a, a book talk that she was doing and, and Jordan was there and, Jordan and I actually um, attended Aldo Sam's 50th birthday together with her, with her um, uh, husband, Robert Bohr, obviously, who is, um, you know, very well known in the wine, wine game. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I get to see her. I get to see her once in a while. She's uh, just a really special, sweet, sweet lady. So Ellen from yeah. Headley and Bennett? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. We, she's, we, she's such an amazing guy. That's one of the yeah, people know if they don't Incredible know. woman, incredible uh, force toward a force. A force I don't know yeah, she that's a good way to describe her. Yeah, she is. I mean, she, um, uh, she, she would not mind me telling this story, but it's like, because I was telling this, you know, she was talking to me about like, you know, how it is now traveling and being a mother. And she was like, oh my God, I have old school breast pumps that I have to take. <laughs> you know, I was just the most open, you know, yeah. um, wonderful yeah. wonderful lady I, I know she wouldn't care because i think she posted a, a photo of that pump i could see her on, she that. brought a pump to hot luck i know that yeah oh yeah that's what that's what <laughs> she was talking about i was i was actually talking to her in hot luck so we needed some yeah. and, and her was, team is really she fosters a great organization all those people yeah, are yeah, she's, so happy and she's on the she's on the cutting edge of of, of, of all things and um, yeah but yeah so uh, and she's very close to jordan as well so we got to see her um together there and um we didn't have any of that unfortunately and i really was sick i mean i thought i was goner i was gone we're talking about cooking in hot luck and how hot it is i also yeah. cook i also cooked the first day at that event at franklin and then in off we go um the event at aaron's place was nothing because you can go in you can get you can hide somewhere you know um yeah. <clears throat> but the one in Alfuego was just brutalizing. It was just crazy, crazy, crazy. <laughs> was that that was you? That was before the pandemic, or did you do? You, yeah, oh, yeah, I cooked it before the pandemic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I don't remember seeing photos of you at the, but I saw not this year. No, I, I it was it was the year before the pandemic, I think, or the year before that. It was. Did uh, Jordan? I, I was going to ask you, did Jordan show up for that, or did, was he not able to? Make it? No, I don't think he made it. But Aaron and I talked about him for a little bit. Oh yeah. 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 Because I said, I go, I met your friend Jordan McKay. And he goes, oh, Jordan and I talked about that. So Jordan definitely followed up with Aaron after our podcast. And That's cool. According to Aaron, he had a really good time on the podcast. <laughs> oh, you could tell he did. You could tell yeah. he did. Yeah. That makes, I mean, that just was, it was humbling. You could tell flattering. if Jordan's, I, I watched that podcast, by the way. You could tell if Jordan's engaged or not engaged. And he was definitely engaged. I wanted to know, because you said you're now starting to, you're after this, you're going to meet about, 
uh, working on the wine list for the yeah. hometown. And there's the three, are the, all three locations, will they have the same wine list? Because it seems like no. Miami has different. No, no, my, Miami, um, I wouldn't, I w- yeah. They're all going to through a c- complete change right now. Um, the problem we had in Miami is we actually went for it in Miami as well, not as big as New York, but we had, I think, 14 by the bottles, by the bottle, uh, about a bottle list. Then we had um, eight by the glass in Miami. And the culture in Miami is very strange as far as wine is concerned. It just, it just, first of all, the incredible amount of, um, you know, uh, people from different parts of Latin America have their own concept of what 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 they like to drink and a lot of those are very big bold red wines and we obviously tried to lean to very um well farmed um well made uh winemakers that were friends um you know for instance in miami patrick capiello's you know renegade wine is on is on our it's like a it's like a um, cab franc syrah carignan like kind of blend um but we, we really went for it there and we didn't get a response to be honest with you. It was, it was, um, we had, we, Jeff Porter came out to Miami and did all the staff training. I currently do staff training every time, you know, I go back. Um, and it's just really difficult for people to get on board and, um, really get intrigued with the wine program in Miami. Um, so we, we have now gone to, and are going to go, we're changing all those wines now. We're going to literally go to like one sparkling, maybe two, uh, like a white, a rosé, maybe two reds, and that's pretty much going to be it. They'll all be well thought out wines. Um, but I think at hometown, we're going to probably end up at about 12 wines um, instead of that big wine list. But they'll all be, um, they'll all be really, you know, important wines to me well both locations because industry city i, I talked to and i i'll mispronounce his last name robert seitzma and it's seitzma seitzma, seitzma, yeah. seitzma and he was saying that that industry city was that the one that when you and i talked it was going to be like pastrami centric and kind of a deli style is it yeah but it, the menu does online doesn't look uh, can you describe those two locations and uh well in the, the industry city located the, the reason we really went you know, I didn't want to open even a second hometown. I, you know, Aaron and I had spoken about this a million times, like having this one special place. And but when I opened the Miami restaurant, it was just because the space was so unique. It's amongst the oldest Latino and Caribbean produce and spice market in all of Miami. Wow. It's in a very underserved, underprivileged area in Miami. And part of my philosophy as a restaurateur now, not that I'm not cooking in the restaurants anymore, is to have an impact on the communities, which I, I live and own restaurants. And um, if I, if I don't do that, then what's the, what's the purpose of who I am and what my mission is. So that's why I opened Miami and then industry city we needed a, we needed a commissary kitchen and they had a large space. It was like, I don't know, I want to say 6,000 feet, something like that. It was huge. But we needed to, to a commissary kitchen. And part of the deal I made in Industry City was that I would have this little retail location. So I wanted to make the menu a little more unique because, you know, hometown of Red Hook's only a, less than a 10-minute drive from, uh, from the Industry City location. So it's a very small space. It's like a railroad space. Um, and it's designed um, not nothing like either of the other restaurants. And we did want the menu to have options that you couldn't get at all in um, in the other locations. The problem was that when the pastrami, the pastrami is, was like a life's work to me. Um, you know, you grew up in New York as a kid in New York. You know, that's that's it. That's like uh, it's like tackling a brisket as a barbecue cook in in Texas. Um, but for me, it's always been a, on my radar that I wanted to add pastrami. I, I did pastrami beef ribs. Beef, you know, I was definitely one of the first people to do that, like when I traveled and stuff like that. But I wanted to do the pastrami and uh, it kind of it kind of backfired because we did the pastrami in Miami. I mean, in Industry City, and it became so popular that we couldn't keep up with it because it's just so expensive to make pastrami and it takes such a long time. Um so we then it was like a seven six day a week thing and then we had now it's only served on friday saturday sundays we actually 
um, you know, we had tacos, um, you know, uh, Miguel Vidal gave me a long time ago, his flour recipe, flour, his family's flour tortilla recipe. So we had those, which was really good. And, you know, we had some other items that, that weren't on the other menu. Um, but now there was such a demand that we had to put them in Red Hook because people wanted to go to the mothership. Oh, that's how it happened. Okay. And that's how it happened. So it's not, it's not very different. Um, but we do offer like the smash, the smash burger is there now. I would never do a burger in Red Hook. That would be impossible to keep up with. But um, so we do a smash burger there now. We do, you know, these, these little uh, cottage fries like uh, Aaron, like JG Mellon in the city. Oh, yeah. Um, so we, so, you know, so we do a couple of different things in industry city, but industry city is really just a lunch spot that all the people that work in industry city can go to. And then right next to industry, uh, in our industry city location, we basically built an event space because everybody wanted to rent hometown for their wedding or party. And we couldn't do that. We had so many people coming from all over to come to the restaurant. So we built almost a replica, but, um, but that was that was a that was definitely a, a poor business decision on on my behalf because I didn't realize that without putting a room divider in I couldn't do a party for like fifty people because it was a hundred and twenty person room and then you know if you didn't have between seventy and one hundred and twenty people you know someone wanted a two hundred person affair you couldn't do that so I've now completely gutted the whole place and redesigned it it essentially looks like a restaurant in Copenhagen like um, a moss or something it's oh. has murals and it's very industrial it's all blue steel instead of wood um, there's an art exhibit in there right now and I did a deal with design within reach to to do the furniture for us there so oh. it's very modern and it'll be called Billy's Place um, and we'll have chefs and sommeliers and winemakers from around the world come every month and do these huge dinners not huge but like 50 60 person dinners um, and it's going to be an interactive space with just all different kinds of people and, um, and, and an opportunity for me to really have friends from around the world uh, show, show what they do um, in That's this so really great. unique design space. So I'm really proud of this. Uh, I never, I said, I'd never put my name on anything. Um, you know, I named hometown after my grandmothers who immigrated to Red Hook from Norway and Ireland. Uh, so people always think hometown is her name because I'm from hometown. I mean, it's my hometown, Brooklyn, but it's not. It was because of my grandmothers immigrating here in the, in the, in the early 30s. But I am calling it Billy's Place and uh, the dinners would be called Billy and Friends, which started at the James Beard House. Uh, the James Beard House was kind enough to allow me to do, uh, they wanted me to do a dinner there a couple of years in a row. And uh, after the first dinner, the second dinner, I was like, people could just come to Brooklyn to have the barbecue. You know, I don't think it's unique to have it in the James Beard house. And they were really kind enough to let me do a billion friends thing. And so it was me, Missy Robbins, who's a very well-known um, badass chef here and in, in, in restaurateur here in New York. Um, uh, Mark Ladner, who is the only four-star uh, New York Times <laughs> chef, uh, who's a dear friend of mine, who always. Oh, oh chef. you mean Clark Kent? Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, from Del Posto, and then Mark Iacona, who owns Lucali, which is like the the, the best pizza place in, in town here in New York, and and then my dear friend and all our friend Elliot Moss from uh, Asheville. <laughs> oh, well, and, uh, what an interesting mix. Yeah, well, that was the point. That was the whole. Him. That was the whole point, and I don't think. Uh, I think when Elliot got the call, he was absolutely beside himself. He hadn't cooked at the Beard House before, and um, you know, it was just such an amazing opportunity for him to come in and show what he show what he did. And um, it was so funny because Mark Iacona, who owns Lucali, who um, you know, it's a cult thing here. People are queuing up now at two o'clock in the afternoon for a six o'clock reservation in his little pizzeria, but. Mark was, you know, a very confident human being, but was very scared to cook at the Beard House. And so was Elliot, I think. Um, and, you know, Mark, Mark makes this really, um, you know, Italian-American cuisine that's just, just amazing. And I grew up with that on Sundays here in New York, eating that kind of food. And Mark winded up making a salad with these, like, uh, like a tomato salad, basically, with a beautiful meatball in the center of the salad. It was a meatball salad. And he was definitely afraid to put this out there in the James Beard house. But I said, you know what? I guarantee that that dish is going to steal the show. And it did. And then Elliot's dishes, of course, were just on another planet. Like Elliot has a mind that is yeah. just, is, is pretty ridiculous if you ask me. So, oh, yeah. uh, 
but but there was just this great culmination and that's that's what led me to to think of how much fun i had and how much interaction and how different all the people were uh, at the billion friends at the beard house so i wanted to re re redo that um in um in billy's place in uh, in in brooklyn how far off if is I that could. right away oh. gonna have the first one will probably be in august the okay. furniture we're just waiting for the furniture uh, which comes mid July. So I think the first one will be August. If I could cook with anyone, I would want to cook with Misty Robbins. I've never met her. Well, I can make that um, happen but, real quick. We can we can uh, make that happen super quick. Well, the billion well the billion friends that Missy is in will be her starring Aaron Pages now. Ah. So her her I think they're married. Her wife Talia used to work with me at uh, Italian Wine Merchants. So I've known Talia for a long time. She's moved on to do really big things. See, oh yeah, well I'll make that happen one hundred percent. It's on oh. record. Oh, awesome. that's wow, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah, and yeah we I actually get... called Missy. I actually called Missy. I, I called Missy a couple of days ago because um, you know we we um, we change out the pot. You know, uh, fresh pastas, handmade pastas. Um, we do two uh, at tavern, and you know we we've never had a problem before, but we've been having like. I don't know what it is. Something, something's going on with the cavatelli. We do this simple peasant dish, cavatelli and peas with yeah. homemade ricotta and four different kinds of peas and, you know, spring peas. It's just this really light, beautiful dish. But the pasta has just not been right. So I actually called Missy the other day. And of course, in one sentence, she fixed the entire problem. <laughs> was um, it the water? And no, and no, it was just the, the technique, of course. It goes back to the science, right? She's uh, She... she she has, it's actually a recipe in her book for a, um, a, a, a dough that's made with semolina zero, zero and water. It's really, it's really, really simple. Yeah. Um, and, and it's not, uh, it's not a, a recipe that she actually uses in the restaurants per se, but it's one that's very dear to her heart and the one she cooks at home with her loved ones and stuff. So, um, and then of course, you know, it, it was perfect right after that. Yeah. So Missy, you talk about tour de force. Missy is, uh, she is a badass gal and um, really, really uh, incredibly, incredibly talented. Incredibly talented. Yeah. I that I don't know. I'll, I'll research after this. I, so her, her, her two amazing. restaurants, her two restaurants in, are in New York is uh, her first one was called Lilia, is called Lilia. Um, you know, it's a critically acclaimed restaurant. And then she opened yeah, I've heard a, the name. And then she opened a restaurant called Missy, M I S I, that is. Um, 10 pastas, 10 veg, and then they have a steak uh, that's a, a verbal on the menu. This is a steak Fiorentina, and that's it. And the restaurants are just exquisite. I mean, I'm pretty sure both of them got three stars. Wow. Well seen, both restaurants, three stars. Do you know Talia? Yeah, very well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I, I think you would walked away. Talia wrote up, Talia had a piece written about me in Punch, um, by a guy named Brad Parsons, who wrote the book on Amaro and Bitters. Okay, so he lives in Houston now. No. Brad? No, he lives uh, around the corner from me. Okay, I'm thinking about a different Parsons. Oh, Jeremy Parson, never mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But So Talia and I used to work together at Italian Wine Merchants with this other person, Jeremy, who now randomly lives here in Houston. Um, but yeah, I've known Talia. She was like 23 and knew every wine she's like a wine encyclopedia she is so talented her palate was just so mature and she we would joke we were like how do you know so much about wine and she's like I've legitimately just been drinking really good wine for a long time like I don't think she was at parties like chugging Bud Light um, no no definitely not <laughs> and um no she, yeah, she has she a very was, refined palate for sure and, and yeah uh, as well with cocktails she's really 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 brilliant yeah. Now I, I saw I, in that article that both you guys were in, uh, and I'll put a link to that below. You had mentioned Beaujolais is, and I'm pronouncing that correctly. Beaujolais. Oh, the Brad Parsons, the Brad Parsons interview. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, the Brad Parsons interview. Yeah. Okay. And Beaujolais, can you talk yeah, about I'm obsessed. that? Obsessed. I'm obsessed. Completely obsessed with Beaujolais. And why is that? Well, I just think it's the most. It's in a region known for so many insanely expensive wines, and it's this. It's like the. It's like the, the, you know, the redheaded stepchild in a way to some hoity-toity wine drinkers. And I happen to know some of the great winemakers in Beaujolais, and they are the hardest working, most fun, 
crew of, of human beings, most, no, most together, they remind me a little bit of us, like the barbecue, like they'll jump for anyone. <laughs> um, you know, particularly uh, my friend, Michelle Smith, who, man, uh, what a great story. Michelle Smith was the wine director at Brooklyn Fair, the first um, Michelin star restaurant from Brooklyn. Um, and um, went out to, uh, I'm going to paraphrase here the story because it's her story to tell, but, but uh, Michelle went out to do harvest and, um, and, and met a gentleman named David Chappelle and, you know, came back and then, you know, they had a, a, a long distance little relationship or whatever. And then just, she decided to pick up and it's like one of the best love stories, right? Pick up and go to live in Beaujolais and, um, they, they make wine together now on the, the yeah, Domain Chappelle label. And, um, it's some of the most, you know, incredible Beaujolais made and it's, you know, them now they have, uh, you know, twin girls and a, and a new baby. And, you know, it's just that great, great wine story. They, they work these crazy slope vineyards together alone. You know, it's, it's the great story. It's a, a husband, wife, a donkey and a dog, you know, and that's, that's, that's it, you know, and, and, <laughs> Some of the that's, craziest that's wines. That's the same in, way we are here at, at yeah. Barbecue. There's a donkey and a dog. Exactly, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but me and Patrick are the donkeys. <laughs> but the Beaujolais like is something Patrick that I think a lot of people aren't familiar with. And well, I, I think it's I just so great. It's just, just so universal. First of all, there's, uh, as, uh, as Aaron knows, there's 10 crews in Beaujolais. Um, so there's so many different options to flavor profiles of the wine and you're sent you're, you're it's Burgundian wine. It's like, it's really significant wine. I mean, I want to pick one up today. I was definitely. Yeah. yeah. So you're like, if you want something more pretty and elegant, a little peppery, you know, you go flurry. If you want something with more big structure to it, you go more gone. Okay. Um, you know, but like she's making great yeah. wines from Chiroble and she's, you know, so there's just so many Beaujolais is a really interesting place because there's 10 places. There's 10 crews that are making wine totally, like not totally, but different styles. And it's, uh, you know, and it's the most value of any wine you can ever find in Burgundy. And, and I will say that, you know, as someone who collects wine as well, you know, I've been buying into, you know, so normally Beaujolais, you know, people think of Beaujolais as like Beaujolais Nouveau, who, which, you know, comes Carbonic out. Carbonic maceration. Yeah. And, listen, exactly. But I love, listen, a lot of the wine is, is, is you know stem inclusion and carbonic maceration and all that but but the the fact that there's just so many different um terroir places within this one region of of i think you get a lot of options on flavor profiles of burgundy um and and it's it, and it's just not that expensive comparative to yeah. um to to you know dujac you know what i mean it's yeah. like it's not a four it's like yeah, it's great wine, but it's, you know, it's, it's nestled right in that region, but it's not. Yeah, yeah. And and I think Gamay is just such a unique grape, um, you know, different, obviously, from Pinot Noir. That's, the, you know, the, the, the grape in, in, in most of Burgundy. But I think Gamay is just a very, very unique, versatile grape that does a lot of different interesting things and a lot of different yeah. crews around, around Beaujolais. And just the people are just celebratory and fun wow. and they're like a they're a really tight-knit group of people in this in this like really small area of of of, uh, of burgundy that you know is definitely underrated underrated wines i mean beaujolais you know especially with our burger at tavern i mean we have Anne sophie de bois um uh, is making some really beautiful she's becoming like a cult natural wine maker in in beaujolais and um and we we pour her by the glass and it's definitely the most popular burger pairing um wine on our on our Listen. menu because of uh the dry age with you know Pair, pairing wines is, is another home that we can do it another yeah, that might be <laughs> pairing because wines. that's yeah, we're definitely something do you Aaron do you are you really um, when you're selecting wines for for your restaurants are you um, is that is that a big thing for you is trying to pair wines or it's, introduce winemakers I, we start I think the the top most important criteria for us is the people making the wine and do we like them? Do we want to support them? Do we like how they're doing it and what they're doing? And the list 
that we have only includes people that we can name the winemakers and we know their story. And then from there, it's like, we're not going to add something if it's not good with barbecue. But people always ask me, like, I ordered brisket, what wine should I have? And I'm like, well, every wine on our menu is really meant to be good with brisket. There's not really specific wine pairings because we want people to come in and be able, we wanted it to be more approachable. So right. if you want to drink a Chardonnay, we have a Chardonnay that's going to go good with your plate, but it's, it's not necessarily meant to be like, you have to, if you order this, you have to order this, but we, we focus so much. And you said this in the beginning, we focus so much on the producers and the farmers and what yeah. their story is. Yeah, so there's a story important. to every wine on our list. That's what I'm loving I mean, from this interview is, is that. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that is, it's, it's everything. Kevin. I mean, yeah, it's, no, it's, it's that's, what, that's why I do these. That's why I do yeah. the other yeah. it's the people. It's not the people always say, why are you obsessed with meat? I'm not obsessed with meat. Really. It's the people all. that smoke the meat yeah, or, grow, the or meat. raise the yeah. cattle. Yeah. Yeah. So, the stories are just endless. They're endless. I mean, the story I just, I just told of Michelle and David. Uh, wow. uh, Chappelle are, is just one of, so many amazing incredible stories whether they're you know f you know and then there's complicated stories of families that are in strife over vineyards and oh, yeah. land yeah. stuff and that's equally interesting to me for some reason you know well, wine, always... wine is still wine is one of the few things that exists where there's there's more people wanting to do and make wine than there is land and in France and a lot of the old world countries like Italy, but I think particularly you won't see this anywhere more than you see it in France. You can't buy into Burgundy. You can't buy, I mean, you have to inherit it. And if you've got seven kids and they don't all agree or don't all get along or don't all want to do it together, how do you handle that? So yeah, you're seeing a lot of these things where these big plots of, of wine are either being broken up or done or one son takes over and then the other son just middle fingers it and goes to like another wine region and says, I'm going to do it my way better. You see a lot of that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, <laughs> yeah, so again, it's just so many, there's so many unique stories, um, in, in the wine world. And, you know, I think, uh, I think that's that, that'll one day be uh, an interesting book. Yeah. Well, yeah. that also too gives a reason for people that are watching this, that maybe just think that they have to pair whiskey for some reason with, with, with barbecue or just pair beer with barbecue. Well, I'm going to go, I'm going to go on the record here and say that wine is easily the best pairing for barbecue and it has nothing to do with my passion for wine. It's just, if yeah. you think about it as an, as a, as an analytical human being, mm -hmm. the things that a, a beer or a whiskey are made of and, and how they taste are in direct opposition to me that, yeah. What, what you'd want yeah. to eat with a delicious, fatty, unctuous, anything. Mm -hmm. um, so where wine, um, you know, there's so many characteristics of wine that would will bring out flavors in beef, pork, poultry, uh, sausage. You know, a favorite, a favorite game that we play uh, at, at, at Red Oak Tavern is what, what pizza would you pair this wine with? I think it's a hilarious thing because, you know, people have so many like... You know, hey, uh, if we're going to, uh, you know, if we're going to a pizzeria and we're getting a pepperoni pizza, what wine are you drinking? And it tells a lot about the person. I, we don't have to answer this right now, but I would say, you know, it's a funny thing, Aaron. You should stop playing with your wine friends because it'll get you an understanding where that wine mind is at all the time. Yeah. But yeah, I, I, you know, I, I think barbecue just wine allows the barbecue to be enhanced as an experience where. Listen, I love drinking a nice cold beer. There's, there's nothing like it in the hot weather or something like that. But as a contrast to the meat that you're eating, it really doesn't make sense yeah. to me. And the whiskey is just doesn't make any sense to me. But that's, yeah. that's well, that's another I, thing I'm, that's been sold, I think. But. I'm going to quote right. a very wise, uh, a very wise person who said, if you look at it pragmatically, wine is a much better barbecue pairing than beer. Do we yeah. know who said that? Um, that was you, Billy. I, I was just going to say. I think I, I think I read that. <laughs> it's a, That's probably it's the only thing you use the word pragmatically. Yeah, I like that you use it, that word too. That's. <laughs> it's true. Uh, I, I absolutely mean, it's... believe that. I absolutely do believe that. And I would be, um, I, I would never use the word, be. I would argue the fact, uh, but I would debate the fact with 
anyone who would like to debate that while we eat barbecue and drink wine instead of, <laughs> instead of drinking beer. And listen, everything has a place in time, um, but uh, an extremely hoppy beer, you know, mm. paired with anything barbecue related just absolutely does not make any sense to me whatsoever. It leaves this like... I don't know. It just doesn't make sense to me. It's the the mouthfeel yeah. is wrong. Film or something or almost like a... Yeah, just the mouthfeel is wrong. And I just believe that there is so many wines that just enhance every single thing, whether it's, you know, Beaujolais having this little pepper note that that just pairs well with brisket or, or our burger, which has a lot of pepper on it. And, or like, you know, a super, you know, a Gruner Wittliner or Riesling, you know, or, you know, the high acidic wines from the, the Savoie or the Loire Valley, yeah. like all the, you know, high Alpi wines that have this high acid and they just really cut through the, you know, the, you know, bacon or pork shoulder or, or any of those things paired with, you know, a really, you know, tart dry high, high acidic wine i just think is just makes sense it just makes it taste better and, I, yeah. and it does not have to cost a lot of money money it may cost more than i don't know what your average per glass price of wine has to be where you are or you're at but um it's it's obviously more expensive than buying you know a, a modello or tecate or whatever you know but at the end of the day, I think you get just so much more out of the experience when when you compare yeah. a really really nice wine to uh, to your to to any cuisine. Well, and we talk so much about structure, and I think that's a really important factor in in putting food and a beverage together. Like, so the structure of wine, I think, lends itself better to is capable of lending itself better to a platter of barbecue. But the other thing that we don't talk about that often is wine is sold as a bottle. It's like meant to be shared, right? I mean, not many people are going to buy a bottle and go sit at a table with a large platter and eat it by yourself. Barbecue is meant to be shared. And I feel like wine is really, it's like community driven, right? Like you and I have built a relationship over sharing wine because that's what you're supposed to do with wine. And I think it just lends itself to like the ethos of what barbecue is. Yeah, I don't drink wine alone. It's a community meal. I don't drink wine alone. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's not what you said last night, but... Um, nah, well, yeah, but I, I wasn't alone. <laughs> I just said, how much wine could I drink? No, but I tend to... Well, I'm, I said, I'm what time is the thing? Guys. So I know what, how much wine I can drink or, or what time I should go home. But I was definitely not alone. I was with a, a, <laughs> yeah. a Fair point. good group of wine. We, 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 yeah. we actually have our, our little pod of wine friends uh, is... is it has been known to do a lot of blinding and that's that is truly how i've started to over the last say four years probably really collect a significant database of of, of yeah. wine uh you and know you, I, you start to like think about when you're tasting with other wine people and they're like i i smell boxwoods and you're like boxwoods like I would, <laughs> that's not, that wasn't even in my vocab right so you have like a palette vocab that far grows. as floor yeah, forest yeah, floor. I read forest that floor. last night, Billy. I read Oregon that. Pino right there, that forest floor. Yeah, it's crazy. But, wet but mushrooms. Also, but this is a yeah. great primer for someone who is interested, but, you know, maybe hesitant. They can maybe purchase that book if that's something they're interested. But also start to taste, what drink wine with friends or people that you knew, know that are knowledgeable about wine, and it'll just increase their you know. Their yeah, and don't, and don't let, like, even, even if, don't let that one person who has maybe wines that are they're drawn to yeah be, make you draw to that like you, good point you, I, I really i really don't believe you know there's definitely wines that Aaron and i will share over our friendship that we'll both love and i'm sure there's some that i may open that may not sing to her and vice versa but it's the conversation that is really it's again Aaron just hit it on the head it's this moment of of inclusion and sharing and mm -hmm. and you know, camaraderie and, and, and togetherness that I know it's cliche, but it is very interesting to drink something that's living. I, and and yeah. I, I, I know that's been said a million times, but I really believe that that was also one of the things that drove me to want to know what the stories were. And that also is, is, is an interesting thing about making champagne, right? I mean, it's, it's, the, there's several fermentation process you know whether it's kava who has to be on lilies for nine, nine months and then you know like uh, that, yeah. 
Yeah. And then traditional small grow champagne, 30 months on the lease, you know? So, you and know, Cremant de Jura, which is like my favorite non-champagne sparkling wine from an old world. So that's where we wine. pour, that's where we pour sparkling at hometown and Red yeah. Tavern by the glass. Uh, Francois Mikulski is a famous a winemaker in Burgundy, makes actually a tremendous Cremant that is not expensive uh you know his yeah. burgundies are uh, his white burgundies are very expensive um so that's what we're pouring by the glass um in, in hometown right now francois mikulski uh, which is kind of crazy to, to pour francois mikulski um uh, uh cremant and uh, by the glass by the glass yeah but yeah cremant de jura is oh, i love that again it's crazy under underrated and massive value in cremant um yeah but yeah, so all these processes and the sciences and, and stuff just make all these things just so interesting to me. Wow. Yes. Well, I, I, we've talked for a long time, so yeah. I, I'm going to okay. attempt to, to wrap it up, even though I want to talk to you forever, but I, I can't, we can't end this podcast without me saying my absolute favorite po- uh, barbecue festival moment was you, myself, Patrick, Leanne Bakunis. Uh, Robert Lerma, Wayne Mueller, Chris Shepard, and Lindsey Brown went to Monteverde in New York and drank some beautiful wine. Yeah, in Chicago, we we ordered, I mean, there was probably eight different bottles, but yeah. one of them was the Arpepe. Do you remember that? I know her very well. Yeah, and it was, I've had some of her other wines. This was more high-end than anything that I'd had of hers before. And I was pregnant, so I was just, sipping and tasting and like spitting back and I had like 13 glasses in front of me even though I wasn't swallowing anything but we tried some of the most beautiful wines and that's just one of those experiences that I'll never forget and to me that's clearly that's it like I remember everything about that dinner until I went into a food coma um and it was just so fun but to me that was really what kind of sparked like the barbecue and wine because that whole week was about barbecue but the pinnacle of the week for me was us getting together and having that meal and drinking and sharing all those wines together yeah. um, i love that you mentioned our pay because i mean what an amazing story i mean I'm, i don't want to get off on a tangent here but i got to taste i got to taste with um with them and you know and the, the main winemaker and um uh, matriarch of of the family mm-hmm. there uh, such an interesting plot of land severe sl- severe, severely sloped um, lands that our pepe has to farm and but yeah that's that, that i remember that night very clearly first of all the pastas were just incredible too and amazing yeah. sarah is just amazing amazing chef and it was just that was a really joyous night for me as well so i'm, I'm glad that you brought that up before we let billy go the one wine i wanted to highlight um because I, I believe you're probably familiar this is a champagne this one we have on our list it's the only wine that we have right now that's just by the bottle everything else is by the glass um you can also order bottles but it's the francois bedell i know it. um she's amazing um so this is another example of women in wine just absolutely crushing it um this is from the val de marne uh which is one of the subregions within champagne this region focuses primarily on uh pinot minway which this one is predominantly, I think it's like 75 plus percent. Yeah, 75 percent Pinot Minway with a little bit of uh, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, which she does beautifully. But what she's known for, her story is really cool and I think really inspiring for me. But um, when she got herself into the Champagne region, which is really hard to do um, as not only a woman, this was back in the 80s, but just to get into champagne at the time, a lot of a lot of it was like inherited or you you could come in as a winemaker, but you weren't owning the land, right? So farmer fizz where you're farming the land and then making the wine was really hard to do if you didn't inherit it. And she came in as a single mom and she paved her way um, and her son got really sick and she started, um, nothing was really helping him from a medical standpoint and they weren't sure what was really wrong with him. And she came across some kind of Western philosophies about how to approach health. And this is really kind of early organic biodynamic understanding where your food's coming from philosophies. And she immediately saw a lot of uh, change in her son. He got healthier. 
And so she bought in 150% into what, you know, what it means to really take care of your earth and to take care of what you're growing. And so she pioneered biodynamic farming in Champaign. Um, so not only was she a woman who was just kind of like trying to make it, but she basically led this whole movement and I love what she does. And I love that we have her wine. Um, I didn't great. open it. I didn't open it because I wasn't going to drink it by myself this morning, but, um, but it's, save it for me. I'll save uh, it. And when, Hey, if I, if we still have this bottle, uh, I'm going to bring it to, to Southern smoke. I'll share it with you. I'd love that. And that's a great story. That's a great Marie story. Cort, Marie, Dominique and Marie Cortin has a similar story that she was another yes. one of the, um, the, the, um, uh, the pioneers in for biodynamic farming in Champagne and when it wasn't popular um, and it wasn't popular in a lot of regions, including, you know, Burgundy. And yeah, she was definitely a pioneer of, of, of biodynamic farming. And it's just an incredible story. And I really like this. It's been really cool. And yeah, I'm, down, I'm down for a part man. two. Yeah, yeah. Part two, me and me and fall. Aaron will be uh, feeling a little better. Like, <laughs> we'll, we'll drink. I didn't open a bottle either today. Yeah, and I'll be and I'll be healed up, and we'll be. Yeah, yeah be, you'll be healed up. We're like the walking wounded. Today, but, <laughs> the uh, fact that we did this is exceptional, and I, yeah. I love, I, I love this so much, Billy. And I hopefully, yeah, let's maybe like revisit. Got Run and DMC and the Beastie Boys blessing us right now. We were. We both mentioned that when you were when you were readjusting. <laughs> how, yeah, this is I, my I New that. York wall. This is my dining room. That's Tony Bennett too. Oh, oh wow, that's so great. Thank you so much, Billy. Yeah, much love to y'all. I can't wait to see you in October. And are you are you coming? Are you coming? Uh, are you going to get out of your hut there and come uh, to any of these events? Hope Thank to you. see you around. I hope to see you too, and I hope to come visit you in New York. And of course, I'd like to actually meet Erin in the flesh too. I haven't I've never been her personally <laughs> either. So I'm here. Well, get out, get out to Houston in uh, in October, and you can meet you can meet okay. a whole bunch of cool. Yes. People. Yeah, that sounds like fun. I can guarantee there's going to be some sick wine strength that week. Ah, uh, well, yeah. I have to then. We could maybe do uh, something, uh, at least photos from there. But excellent. This has right. so, been so great. Thank you so much for joining us. All right, man. Y'all have a great day and, uh, and I'll talk to you real soon. Thank you. Both feel better. Yep. Patrick, all right? I will. And hug I that, will. Hug that little boy for me. What a cutie. Yeah. Oh, same with Finn, right? Oh, man. He's getting Boys are so growing big, up. So big, so quick. I know. He's so big. The photos you show. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, Lord. I'm going, I'm going to, I'm, he's going to be back right now from school before I have to go to this wine tasting. So interesting. Thank you, sir. See ya. Thank Bye. you. Yeah, Billy was great. That was so fun. Oh, that was so. Talking with Billy. Yeah. It's always, always great talking to him. But it was, I, I felt like we learned a lot about his journey. And that was, and he, and things that can make wine more approachable for people. And I think yeah. that uh, that's a great, it's, I, I was, I was so great. That <laughs> was wonderful. So one thing, one thing I've always felt about Billy is that every time you hang out with him, you learn more about him. He's a great storyteller mm -hmm. and he has all these stories. And the more you learn, the more you realize just how fascinating he is, mm -hmm. how crazy all of his life experiences are like the, the just insane things that he's done throughout his life. But then to be on a wine podcast, a wine and barbecue podcast with us, it's like Billy's journey brought him here. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> all yeah. the crazy things he's done in life, <laughs> and he somehow wound up here. <laughs> yeah, and then we all wound up, wound up there. But yeah, it's it is. But it's also too interesting because he is so interested in the stories, and yeah. that's what we are so interested. And I thought as he was saying those things, I'm like, that's why Erin does what she does, and that's why I'm interested. Yeah. But but that's how you've created your wine list and. For people that you know that will come visit, you can talk to them, and your staff can talk to them about these specific winemakers and these uh, farmers. And yeah, yeah. So, great. so you have uh, because this is coming out before Father's Day. I want to talk about Father's Day, and there's some other couple of other things that we'd like to discuss about feed, just that we kind of like to do it at the end of these episodes. So, if uh, can you talk, speak about Father's Day? Yeah. So we've got another big party coming up. So we turn one at Spring Branch on the weekend of June 18th. So it's Father's Day weekend. Um, we're hosting our big party on Saturday uh, so that we can give Patrick and our chef and our GM who are all dads so that we can give them Father's Day off. Um, so we're having our party on Saturday, June 18th from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. And the biggest I think the biggest news in all of this is that Patrick is going to be finally doing like a big whole hog event. Oh, cool. He does whole hog all the time at the restaurant, but he does it 
like hidden in the back where nobody can see them. And I'm constantly like, Patrick, you gotta put it out in the front, but do it in the parking lot, do it, you know, where people can see you. And he's just shy about it. Um, Patrick's shy. So <laughs> he's not, but he's shy about whole hog, even though he's the guy that brought whole hog to Houston and, mm-hmm. you know, his whole reputation, I think initially in barbecue was built around whole hog. And mm-hmm. um, he, he was shown how to do this by the best, you know, Rodney Scott um, is one of his close mentors and, a uh, good friend of ours and it's just like we're finally doing this big event and I'm really excited I feel like it's been six years in the making um so that'll be a big focus we're gonna have merchandise on sale so you can get Father's Day gifts um so all of our spices and rubs will will be running at, on special and then we'll have shirts and hats and koozies and whatever else we're gonna have uh, our friend John Egan playing live music the whole time. So from two to six, oh, cool. uh, he'll get some breaks, but otherwise he's pretty much just <laughs> yeah, playing the no entirety <laughs> of the event. <laughs> um, we'll sit there with the web. No breaks, no breaks. <laughs> Keep um, playing. Next song. <laughs> and uh, we're doing Lone Star um, half off. I, it's just going to be a really good time. We're excited. A year seems, it, in a lot of ways, it feels yeah, like it's been two weeks and it also feels like it's been 10 years at the same time. I mean, it's been the hardest year of my life, uh, no doubt. So there's a lot of reasons for us to celebrate. So yeah, we're really excited about our going hog wild event. Um, so it's, so like it's a, not a ticketed event. It's an event you can just come to, right? Yeah. It's just an event that you show up to. We, we recommend you bring your dad, uh, and we recommend that you buy things for your dad while you guys are here yeah. or a dad in your life. Exactly. Or a dad in your life. Or if you don't have a dad, then buy yourself something. Congratulations for raising yourself. <laughs> that's, what I, <laughs> and that's what I would do because I don't have a son nor, <laughs> or a daughter, nor do I have a father. So that's, that's, so that's, you get the credit for you on Father's Day. Yeah. And that's also too, you're also doing some things. I saw you, your newsletter comes out. If people want to sign up for the newsletter. I'll put a link below. Newsletter comes out okay. every Monday and you also have some ability to ship if you're not in Houston or Texas. Yeah, so we do nationwide shipping, um, which you can do from our website. So merchandise, we even ship barbecue. So all of our buy in bulk, bulk frozen vacuum sealed barbecue is available online as well. So you don't have to be local to get to experience Fiji's barbecue with your loved ones on Father's Day. Do you have uh, something with ribs? We've got, so we're, we launched a couple different summer specials because uh, to us, summer is like this really unique time of year we're a neighborhood restaurant and all of a sudden all the kids are out of school and so we were just thinking of you know specials that really seemed right for this time of year and so on Tuesdays now we're doing $30 whole racks of ribs which is if you don't eat them all you take them home it's great um yeah and then on Wednesdays um from five to nine kids eat for free I should say that the rib special is also from five to nine only um so on Wednesdays, kids eat free from five to nine. We also do steak night from five to nine. So those things kind of converge on Wednesday. Your kids come in and eat for free and you can get steak oh. and drink a really nice glass of wine and everybody's happy. Um, and then on Thursday, we don't have a special that's been hashed out just yet, but we're working on getting a taco special oh, cool. up and running. And that would be our <laughs> Thursday special. And then Friday and Saturday, we're just too busy to have specials. So oh. that's it. Those are our, our weekly specials that we've got going on for the summer. Well, that's cool. And that's, and that's also with your, your steak night. So people know it's not the same steak every Wednesday. It's you mix it up, right? Yeah. So we mix it up. I think a lot, like lately we've been really doing the hanger steak okay, kind of okay. repeatedly, but um, starting next week, we are going to be doing um, a new, sorry, next, next week. We're going to be doing a new steak setup for okay. steak night and our chef's been working really hard on it. So I, I don't have all the details yet okay. on what the pickup is going to be, but. Okay. And I apologize to anyone listening or watching me. I need to move close by so I can visit or often it does the <laughs> specifics, but I just knew that you had mentioned that, that you guys do. It's not, it wasn't the same. Cut yeah. We used time. to change it up a lot. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, excellent. Is there anything else that we've missed? Uh, Gosh, I don't know. I mean, it's like event season. I feel like we've been going from one thing to the next. So I'll just say this. Hot Luck was amazing. Thank you so much to Aaron Franklin and all the people at Hot Luck for including Fiji's Barbecue. Um, and Last then weekend. we just did. 
Yeah, that was last, that was two weekends weekends ago. Troubadour was this past weekend, another great event um, by Chase Colston. And we're really looking forward to coming to your neck of the woods because we're going to be in uh, LA, well, south of LA. uh, For Heritage? In in August for the Heritage Festival. Well, I better be able to get to that, yeah. Very excited about that. That's going to be a massive event. So I'll, yes. put a, I'll put a link to that below. I don't know if tickets have gone on sale. They're going on sale pretty soon if they haven't gone. On sale. Uh, yeah, they should be going yeah. on sale soon if they're not already. Yeah. Um, so that and that last yeah. last year, like even like I think Carrie Bexley even showed up at last year. Oh no, the list of pitmasters and it just is massive and it's just like really exciting people. Yeah. I'm like, this is gonna be fun. That person's fun. That mm-hmm. person's fun. That person. Oh yeah. <laughs> Obviously, I'm just there for the fun, right? <laughs> no, but also too, if if you have a chance, uh, San Juan Capistrano is a beautiful little beach community it's wonderful there's like nice little hotels and motels like the kind of more upscale motels there it's yeah. the weather is perfect the location's perfect and i know like last time i think i saw a lot of people that night of after at their hotel partying and enjoying so you could if you somehow stay at the same hotel as your favorite pit pitmasters or barbecue <laughs> people you could hang out with them after maybe yeah so that's really cool i completely forgot about that all right talk to you soon all right have hey. a good week all right take care you too bye, bye.